I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Ranking the top 10 running backs for the upcoming fantasy season, very tough exercise. Had a lot of trouble with it. It's like the fucking overhead squat of fantasy football. A lot of guys, I'm not even going to say there's a lot of guys I like. I think I hate everybody this year outside of Jonathan Taylor, who's the clear RB1, the clear 101, the clear everything one related has Jonathan Taylor's name attached to it. But after that, things get dicey. That's why y'all pay me the small bucks though, because I do the research. I yell at you about it. And we have a good time. So today we're going to talk about the top 10 running backs for fantasy football in 2022. Not dynasty. We're talking about season long redraft content as the people want. We'll do the next 10 in the next video. We'll swap over to wide receivers, and we'll do quarterbacks and tight ends together because no one gives a shit about those guys, unfortunately. You guys show no respect. Sad sight. But we're bike. I hope y'all had a wonderful MDW. Had a great Memorial Day weekend. That was marred filled. I hope you drank irresponsibly. So if you're new to the channel and you want to tack on the rankings, you know, you want to follow along the next, the next group of running backs and then wide receivers and tight ends, whatever, whatever, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Put the D in it. Hit the button that looks like this. Tuck your shirts in. Oh, it's summer out here in NYC. It is officially no pocket mesh shorts season. Stop yelling. Let's eat. Okay. As I mentioned before, um, Jonathan Taylor these are half PPR rankings, so adjust them to your league, which don't draft for three months, so this is fucking irrelevant, but half PPR. That's how I play all of my leagues. It's how I will make all of these positions relative in the video going forward. Jonathan Taylor, clear RB1 here. I don't think there's much to say. The guy rips off multi-double-digit touchdowns. Um, finally got the workhorse role there in Indy. Great offensive line. Love Matt Ryan coming onto the scene. I think that's going to be much more impactful to this team than people are giving it credit for. Um, I was one of the biggest Matt Ryan haters over the last couple of years in terms of fantasy. I thought he brought no upside. I don't think he brings a lot of upside in Indy, though I do think he's draftable this year as opposed to last year. He's going to make this offense run very smoothly, and that's going to mean good game scripts, and good game scripts equal good fantasy point numbers for Jonathan Taylor. Great fantasy point numbers for Jonathan Taylor. Elite fantasy point numbers for Jonathan Taylor. His over-under on... Price picks right now is set at 1,400 rushing yards. That is just rushing yards. Jonathan Taylor had 40 more red zone carries than the next closest bike. Shout out fake intern Tony for that. Austin Eckler, 46 red zone carries, second in the NFL. Jonathan Taylor, 85. 40 more red zone carries than the next running bike. Unbelievable. So unsurprisingly, Jonathan Taylor tops this list. After Jonathan Taylor, I think it'll eventually get chalky to the point where C-Mac is the clear number two on this list, and he is the number two on my list. If you want to fade Christian McCaffrey, I get it. He's hurt you guys in the past. I want to get hurt again. I'm willing to get hurt again. In the dynasty teams that I own him, I have not traded him away. I've been waiting for this moment. The biggest thing to understand with C-Mac is he's not 27. He's not 28. He's not 29. He's not Todd Gurley with knee arthritis, right? We we were like one of the first people to break the whole Todd Gurley's knee is going to be a, like, I remember Dr. Jesse Morse coming on like three, four years ago and being like, this is way bigger of a problem than people realize. And then we touted that for the remainder of Todd Gurley's career until we fucking drove him into a coffin, okay? C-Mac's stuff is not the same, okay? C-Mac's pulled a couple hamstrings, done some shit like that. He's 25 years old, guys. He's still young, and he hasn't had an injury that is predictive of future injuries. I'm bike on board here, man. Per Sal, Sal Vetri, friend of mine, since 2018, Christian McCaffrey has averaged 25.5 points per game, 35% more than the next closest RB. The clear concern, he has missed 70% of his games over the last two seasons. 25.5 points per game. I just can't let that type of upside pass me by. So if I'm sitting there at the 102, the 103, I fade Christian McCaffrey, and then he puts up 25.5 points per game, your friend who took him two spots after you wins your league. Like, it's over, right? And all you're just sitting there with regret, and regret is poison. We are not poisoning ourselves. Last year, C-Mac played seven games, but in four of the games, he played in over 50% of the snaps. So we're looking at a four-game sample size in which he was, like, actually on the field and healthy, right? That's what 50% or more of the snaps accounts for. In those four games, 
he posted more than 21 half PPR fantasy points in every single one of them. That was probably up to 25 in full PPR. Every single one of those four games, over 21 fantasy points. He was the RB1, the RB3, the RB5, and the RB5. Top five in all four weeks. Clean fucking sweep across the board. So C-Mac, my number two. Then we move to the big dog. Big dog. We got to get his ass a sponsorship deal eventually. We got a little bit more clout. Y'all keep subscribing to the channel. Y'all keep hitting the thumbs up button. Maybe Derrick Henry notices us one day. Maybe instead of, you know, when these players retire and they start doing broadcasts for Monday Night Football, Thursday Night Football, the big dog Derrick Henry wants to come in and become a real big dog. Certified. All right, Derrick Henry at the 103. Uh a lot of people are nervous about his foot injury, I guess. It's the age combined with the foot injury. But don't forget, Derrick Henry actually came back last year. Derrick Henry played in the playoff game. It wasn't good. It wasn't effective. And he probably has been slowing down a little bit over the course of his last few years of his career. I mean, the carry totals have absolutely been out of control. Um, and eventually that's going to take a toll. But I don't want you to forget how good he was before he got hurt. Derrick Henry was the RB1 in fantasy points per game last year. By nearly a point and a half over Jonathan Taylor. Of course, it was only half the season. But before he got hurt, he was all sorts of incredible. All right? The Titans have very, very little going for them on offense. They got rid of A.J. Brown. So their clear initiative this season is to continue to give Derrick Henry 600 to 7,000 carries. All right? It's going to run through him. They don't have a pass catching back anymore. They drafted Hassan Haskins, who is like a, a bad version of Derrick Henry. Um, also, not to non-consider not to fuck you guys henry was on pace to set career highs in the passing game last year like pretty fucking easily he could see another 40 to 50 targets in 2022 if you give derrick henry 40 to 50 targets some of those on screen plays where he could break away he's gonna go nuts and on prize picks right now you can get his line for 1450 yards which i would actually take the under on i'm not gonna lie uh i would take the under that is very very high that is like pretty much projecting best case scenario, no games missed, nothing wrong happening with Derrick Henry. So I would hit the under on that. Um, but 1,450 is where they're projecting him, which is the league leader for rushing yards. The cool part about prize picks is they're sponsoring our draft guide, which means that you can go take those lines if you want. If you want our rankings, which is in our draft guide, obviously, the season-long draft guide up on bdge.co, you can get it for the cheapest price by signing up on prize picks. If you go over to prize picks and you throw down $10, uh, $10 into your account, and you use promo code BDGE when you do so, they're going to match your deposit. So you get an extra $10 on top of that to play with on their site. So you can go take Jonathan Taylor over 1,400 rushing yards. And you get access to our guide for free that way. Okay. So you get like six good, cool, valuable things in one just by throwing $10 onto prize picks and using promo code BDG. So Derrick Henry is number three. I've got Najee Harris up at number four. So I've got Najee Harris up at four. Uh, crazy, crazy good. Rookie season, obviously, 307 carries, 94 targets. So you're talking about a rookie season with over 400 opportunities off the rip. He goes over 1,650 all-purpose yards. He scores double-digit touchdowns. The 94 targets, 74 receptions is just crazy. Now, I don't really think that's repeatable. Like, I don't think we see another 100 targets to Najee Harris, but it's very clear that they understood what their weak point was, and that was the run-blocking offensive line. Their offensive line overall wasn't miserable, uh, in terms of pass blocking. They were actually in the top half of the league in terms of pass blocking per PFF. Their run blocking was ranked like 26th or 27th. So they were really bad on that front. And they did what like Tom Brady has done and effectively turned his team's run game into short dump offs. That's what they did for Najee Harris. So I think that is part of what their offense is because they understand their weak points, which is what good coaches like Mike Tomlin do, understand the weak points and understand how to maneuver things around so the weak points don't actually affect the game that much. So Najee Harris was inefficient on the ground. Could have predicted that, but wildly voluminous through the air. I think we see that continue. Does he see 95 targets again? Probably not, but I, I still think he's got a safe target total of like 80, 75-ish, which is going to be top five in the NFL among running backs. He gets all the goal line carries. He gets all the fucking work in that backfield. Really, really safe floor. I would say I'd understand if you wanted to take one of the running backs after him, before him that we're going to talk about in a little bit, because they probably have a little bit more upside. But when you're comparing a guy like you know Najee Harris to – let's say like Joe Mixon or something, right? I think that's more comparable because they're more like ground and pound type guys. I would rather have Na uh, Najee Harris because Mixon's coming off the big touchdown year, right? And Najee's coming off a kind of a poor touchdown year when it comes to rushing, right? 307 attempts and only seven rushing touchdowns. That might just be par for the offense. Um, and they pass the ball a lot, obviously, because they have a lot of good weapons on the outside. 
But I think that presents a little bit of upside opportunity for Najee Harris, and he's just so much more involved in the passing game than, than Joe Mixon is. Joe Mixon has uh, got like half the targets that Najee Harris, or probably less than half the targets that Najee Harris did last year. So that more than makes up for, you know, the offense that he's in and uh, that kind of stuff. So Najee Harris, maybe not the highest upside, but he's a really, really safe RB1 in your lineup. So he'll be my four. We have Dalvin Cook after him at RB5. And I know this might be a little bit controversial and people are like, ah, I don't really want to fucking buy into Cook. But you talk about upside again. He is one of those Christian McCaffrey archetypes where if he's going to play the 13-14 games, you know you're getting elite 13-14 game type production out of him. Again, I ain't going to sit here and be like, the likelihood of him getting injured is higher than everybody else because I'm only technically a doctor, but that's probably fucking true. Um, you know, if we're talking about upside though, man, again, you just look at Dalvin Cook. If you look at the last three years, he's missed, you know, uh, I think three, three and four games over the last three years. But Dalvin Cook's 16-game paced out numbers over the last three seasons, we'll just leave him on the screen to admire. You're talking about 1,900 total yards, 2,200 total yards, 1,900 total yards. And here's the other thing. Here's the other big thing, man. If y'all were Dalvin Cook owners last year, you remember how many fucking times this dude got tackled inside the one-yard line or inside the two-yard line. It hurts. You don't have to remember, though, because that's literally what you pay me for. Cook got tackled inside the two-yard line nine times last year. Nine times. Nine times. Nine times last year. If four or five of those break right and he gets into the end zone, we're, we're, we're way more excited about Dalvin Cook this year, okay? If you look at, again, that pace number, like 2019 on pace for 15 touchdowns, 19 touchdowns. Then 2021 comes, seven touchdowns. What do you think that's a factor of? That's That comes down to the fact that he got, kept getting tackled in the two-yard line. That's just unlucky. Probably won't happen again this year. So Davin Cook on price picks, 1,300 rushing yards. I actually like the under. I think, again, I've said this a lot. You make money on taking the under on prop bets because you never factor in the downside. You never factor in the injury. You never factor in like a role change. You never factor in the offensive scheme changing a little bit, which Minnesota's actually changed. So maybe that means something for Dalvin, but I very highly doubt it. Um, three years ago, he was under 1,300 yards, even paced out to 16 games. 2020, he went nuts, obviously. Last year, under 1,300 yards, paced out much higher, obviously. But, you know, the injuries have added up for him. So he continues to go under that number because of the injuries. And I think betting on the under is probably safe. But, again, the upside is something that's unmatched by most fantasy players. So Cook is my five. Austin Eckler is my six. I've seen him as high as number two. I've actually seen a decent amount of people take Eckler number two. I That's just not what I'm doing here. That feels like you are strictly buying high off of last season and just expecting him to do the same thing. Eckler is going to be way more hurt in fantasy by Isaiah Spiller's draft spot in LA than people are realizing. They are dying to have a bigger back to use with Eckler. They don't want to use him getting 350 touches. That's very clear to me. He had a great fucking season last year, and he can be great again. Like, this is a very, very good offense, of course. Top five in scoring, very high pace. They got Herbert in his prime, a lot of good weapons. The offensive line has been great. Eckler is going to be great. Taking him over Christian McCaffrey, though, is insane to me because the upside is not comparable. Um, Eckler is going to catch a ton of passes, but 12 rushing touchdowns, eight receiving touchdowns. Eight receiving touchdowns is like peak, right? We're not repeating that again. He's had three, three, eight two three in his career now two eights which means that's very doable for him the other years are three three and two though there might be a meeting in the middle we've seen a ceiling we've seen his floor i think that's going to come down the 12 rushing touchdowns was more than he has combined for in the previous four years he had been at two three three one so that's nine rushing touchdowns he scored 12 last year both of the touchdown totals were absolute peak for eckler uh now i hate when people just talk about like regression with no reason for the regression, but Isaiah Spiller coming in as a 220 pound back, very productive in SEC. He's going to get the, a lot of goal line work. Um, he's also a very good pass catcher. The the, t the touchdown number is going to come down, and we're probably looking at like a 1400 total yard back for Austin Eckler, which is great. But if he scores eight touchdowns, he's not worth that RB2 price. He's worth like the RB6, 7, 8, in my opinion. So I like Eckler, but if it's not a full PPR league, I can't see myself digging into the top five for Eckler when the other guys have higher upside on this list next up we've got joe mixon and i really don't want to take him this high but i think you really have to i think the offense is just so ascending he gets so many goal line carries he gets so much early down work seems as if 10 rushing touchdowns is kind of his floor in this offense he had 48 targets last year though 
which was 27th among running backs. Like Chris Evans and Samaji P. Ryan, for whatever fucking reason, play way too much in this offense for me to be comfortable taking Joe Mixon in the top five. But but again, like Mixon scored 13 touchdowns last year, top four in goal line carries and 10 zone carries. And he did it behind a shit offensive line. They ranked 20th in run blocking, 29th in pass blocking. And they have major improvements this offseason. I mean, they they uh, they signed Lyle Collins at tackle, Alex Kappa, Tech Harris. Like, they went out and and said, we're we're going to make sure Nick regrets any take that he has on Joe Mixon in fantasy football this year. And they did the damn fucking thing by adding those three offensive linemen. So this is going to be like Joe Mixon popped off last year on the ground with a shit offensive line. So I'm excited to see what he can do on the ground. I just like it's been very, very clear to me that they want to have someone else in the pass catching role. Again, 48 targets, 27th among running backs last year. Makes me a bit nervous. So is Joe Mixon risky? No. Does he have as much upside as other guys I've already listed? Probably not. A lot of you guys are going to be like, he does have the upside if they let him catch passes. But like, we're five fucking years into Joe Mixon's career, and they've literally never let him do that. So why would they just randomly do it because you felt like commenting on YouTube? Like, that? that's the easiest fade for me is when people just start saying shit like that. Like, what if they just, like, why the fuck would they do that? They just, they did it for five years. Half a decade they've showed you that they don't want to throw Joe Mixon the ball. Half a motherfucking decade. It ain't happening, okay? So Joe Mixon, safe, clear RB1, not RB1 overall upside, in my opinion. Number eight on this list, Uncle Lenny, man. Uncle fucking Lenny. Uncle Lenny got his knees replaced. Uncle Lenny got fucking uh, hair transplants. He's no longer an uncle. He could he could substitute as a high school kid. The way he played last year, he was youthful. He was explosive. He was fantasy fucking gold. And kind of going back to a point I made earlier, one of the best things about Leonard Fournette's situation in Tampa Bay, right? He signs on a three-year, $21 million deal. Like, they, they like him. He's going to be their workhorse there. It's being tied to Tom Brady, but... In the reason that, like, Tom Brady, again, has shifted his run game to become a short passing game offense. What they did in Pittsburgh, what Brady has done in Tampa Bay, and what he did at the end of his career in in New England, man. That's just the way he plays his game. And Leonard Fournette is the clear benefit of that. So, of course, you get tied to the Brady offense, which means a lot of scoring opportunities, which means a lot of dump-offs, which means a good offensive line. It's The upside for, for Lenny is so, so high, right? Last year, Lenny played... 14 games. He had 84 targets and 69 catches in 14 games. Paced out to six, uh, paced out a full 17 games. That's over 100 targets, which is insane for a running back. I mean, it's just insane consistency here. If you look at the target number totals, the lowest target number total he had on the year last year was three. But outside of that, like five, five, six, four, five, nine, six, eight, eight, seven, seven, nine. Like, look at the last seven games nine, six, eight, eight, seven, nine. That's insane. You could literally not give him rushing production you can give him three carries a game as long as he gets that target total he's going to be like a top 15 fantasy uh fucking running back Leonard Fournette getting a minimum three target Joe Mixon was begging for three targets a game last year fucking on his knees begging and couldn't get it Leonard Fournette though man Sheesh. and one of the best offensive lines in the NFL they got in Tampa Bay they just brought in Shaq Mason top five run blocking uh guard in the NFL Hell of targets he was sixth in 10 zone carries second highest scoring team in the NFL I mean there's not much downside here Sure, like Rashad White is there, can play a little bit of a role, maybe take a few of the targets away. This is a rookie with Tom Brady. Like, Tom Brady ain't going to stand for any shit that Rashad White does wrong. He's going to be off the field immediately if he fucks up. And Rashad White's kind of a raw prospect, honestly. Played Juco two years, so I'm not, I don't know, I don't think he's that refined. So I'm not really too worried about it. So I got Lenny at eight. I've got DeAndre Swift at nine. Um, DeAndre Swift is another guy that I'm, I'm probably going to caution people not to get too overly high on this offseason. Because if you want to, like, make fun of Dalvin Cook and say, hey, you can't draft him because he's fucking absolutely brittle, Swift is kind of going along that line. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but Swift is missing as much time as Cook is in his NFL career. Obviously, Cook had the ACL tear, so save me the fucking whatever. But since the ACL tear, uh, the last three years, Cook has played 13, 14, and 14 games. Swift has come into the NFL and played 13 and 13 games. It's going along that trajectory where you can kind of pencil him in to miss two or three games per year, and that hurts, obviously. Um, a lot of his production, I don't know how repeatable this is, but a lot of Swift's production, of course, came in the last five minutes of games last year where he was catching six dump off passes that led to 60 receiving yards. He got way more goal line work than I thought he would because the Lions offense was a little bit better than I had given him credit for. And that led to Swift on the goal line a lot. We also have, there was a lot of people injured last year, um, that led to a lot of targets for DeAndre Swift, I think. So last year was definitely not best case scenario for DeAndre Swift. I think a lot of fantasy goodness is still to come in his career but I don't want to get overly high on the ceiling 
that I don't actually think Swift has. I think he'll be fun, an explosive player that gives you really high boom weeks and gives you a nice target total floor. But I think we'll see a lot of you know hot takes where DeAndre Swift could be the overall RB1, where I just don't see it, okay? Unless the Lions like really fucking surprise this year, which I do think they're a way better team than giving credit for. Like I love what they did there in Detroit, like, you know, creating a really physical environment, a fun environment where they were really close in a lot of games. I think we'll start to see some of those games drip to the dub column and we'll start to see them rack up a few more dubs um, than whatever Vegas has them projected out right now. But you know what? Vegas is starting to respect the Lions a little bit. On uh, on BetUS right now, they've got the over-under for wins in the regular season at six and a half. Six and a half. Um, I don't know if I'd be willing to say they win seven games this year. I would probably take the under on that. And if you all want to go bet on that, you can. They've got Houston at four and a half wins. I think I would just take the fa- fucking absolute under on that. Um, on BetUS, if you go and, and uh, make your first deposit, they will match it if you use promo code BDGE. So if you go on BetUS, you put $100 down. They will give you an extra hundred dollars to play with. So you'll have two hundred dollars to bet with if you use promo code BDGE on betus.com. Okay, so DeAndre Swift is number nine. Number ten was tough, man. Number ten was freaking tough. I ended up going with Alvin Kamara at number ten. I don't even really feel comfortable talking about Alvin Kamara because there's so much uncertainty around him. There's uncertainty around the Saints offense, Michael Thomas, uh, Alvin Kamara's legal situation. Is he gonna get suspended? Jameis Winston's knee being wobbly now we're hearing reports of. I don't really know what to make of Alvin Kamara's situation. I'm going to put him in as number 10 right now because I think he deserves that. I think we deserve to give Alvin Kamara respect. I think he's a guy where if this offense breaks right, I think there'll be a good offense. I I mean, they've always had a very good offensive line, right? They've always had a great run blocking line, which I don't think will be different this year. Of course, Sean Payton is gone, so things might be a little bit, you know, crazier in the backfield, but he's got really no competition, right? It's like Tony Jones, Abram Smith. I think Mark Ingram might still be there, but he'll probably retire or get cut. So realistically, they don't have like a, a second, third, or fourth round running back competing with Alvin Kamara. So he's cl- clearly the still like lead featured back in this offense. And I think if Jameis Winston is healthy, if Michael Thomas is on the field, they sign Jarvis Landry, they uh, they drafted Chris Olave in the first round, they've got a good offensive line. Like all the pieces are there to be a good offense. And Alvin Kamara is one of those guys that kind of needs to benefit from a good offense because a lot of what made him great, obviously he's a great pass catcher, but a lot of what made him great in the beginning of his career was those crazy rushing touchdown numbers, right? He was ripping off 13, 14, 18 touchdowns a year in the first couple of years. And that made him so valuable. So if he's on a bad offense, then we don't really want Alvin Kamara because like he doesn't do a ton on the ground, right? He doesn't rip off 100-yard rushing games. He does have big, obviously, receiving number totals, but that's not really much better than like DeAndre Swift, right? But if this offense is good, this guy is so good on the goal line. He's scoring 12 rushing touchdowns um, along with, you know, three, four, five receiving touchdowns. And I think this New Orleans offense has the potential to be a, a very, very underrated good one in, an, in a division where they're playing the Carolina Panthers twice and the Falcons twice and whatever. Um, you know, the Bucks defense is obviously good, but Brady's going to put up a fuckload of points. So that's kind of a shootout. So I like Kamara at 10. Um, this could easily change with, you know, a report that comes out like tomorrow about his legal situation or any of those other, you know, revolving door red flags that I've just mentioned. So we've got Kamara at 10 and that wraps up the top 10 running back rankings. Uh, on Sunday, Noah did a really good video looking at the prize picks props of his favorite um, over under rushing totals on prize picks for season long. So Noah's done a ton of dynasty and rookie stuff, but if you're interested in hearing about his season long stuff, go check out Sunday's video. I'll put it on the screen here. If you want our rankings, Price Picks also does that for you. PricePicks.com. Use promo code BDGE when you deposit. If you're not in a state that's eligible for Price Picks, y'all can always cop it at BDG.co. Just straight up, straight up cash, raw money. If y'all still know what that is, barely even remember what cash is nowadays. Hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And just to recap, it's Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, Derek Henry, Najee Harris, Dalvin Cook, Austin Eckler, Joe Mixon, Leonard Fournette, DeAndre Swift, Alvin Kamara rounding out the top 10. Tomorrow's video will be, or whenever the next time y'all see me on the big screen, will be the next 10 running back rankings for season long. Subscribe if you want to hear me yell about them.